So hi, um, I was going to go over some of the attack vectors, but I'm going to skip over that fairly quickly because Ralph's covered it pretty thoroughly. So um, what I was going to talk about was a little bit, just a summary of the attack vectors. I was then going to go through some experimental approaches that we've been trying on BIND, um, but generically go through the types of approaches that we're using. I've also got some results because we've had a number of um, ISC's customers using our test mitigation strategies in production environments, and the outcomes have been mostly successful but quite interesting to look at. Um, and as a result of that, we have some other ideas that we're thinking about before we put this into mainline production. Uh, we've been a little cautious um, in putting the mitigation strategies out into the open source code because we, A, wanted feedback, and B, we wanted to make sure that we didn't put something out into the wild that caused more problems than it actually solved. So, um, I don't think I probably need to say this. Um, the attack isn't aimed at the recursive servers, they are collateral damage. Um, but one thing that wasn't mentioned, well, it was mentioned in passing, what we were trying to deal with with putting in the mitigation strategies was in part to stop hitting the authoritative servers that are under attack, but as well as that, or primarily to protect the recursive servers that people are running because you need to protect the DNS experience of the other clients and not have other things impacted as a result of the attacks going on. Uh, this is an old slide. I think this is probably still one of the ways of identifying an attack in that the point of, or the, per the vector of the attack is to make enough unique queries to the authoritative server that every query that the recursive, receiver, recursive server receives has to be sent on to the authoritative server. So the uniqueness and therefore the randomness of the names is what makes it possible to identify them. And the source used to be open resolvers and still is in some cases, but as has been pointed out, the attack is now becoming much more sophisticated. So what are you likely to see if you're running a recursive server and you are suffering this type of attack traffic? Um, typically, it will be increased client queries. Um, initially, while the authoritative servers are responding, there'll be an increase in NX domain responses being sent back to you and then being sent back to your clients, uh, the clients that are involved in the attacks. Um, and then ultimately you'll see an increase in serve fail responses, um, either because your server has been blocked by the authoritative servers um, or because your server is no longer able to contact them because they are just suffering. Um, and then what happens due to the resource consumption by the recursive server, the resolver trying to tackle this traffic, is that other traffic will be impacted. Um, queries to other domains that should be getting answers may start getting serve failed or the server not responding. And that's because your resolver is struggling under the load of handling the attack traffic. So you have drop responses, you might find that your server is increasing in its memory consumption. Um, two main reasons for that being that your server is having to maintain a lot more context information about the clients that are sending it queries. Um, the other reason is that you might be filling up your cache with all of these NX domain responses coming back from the authoritative servers who are initially handling the traffic okay. Um, increased CPU use as well in some cases, and sometimes if you're using firewalls that do um, connection table, uh, persistent connection table stuff, then you, you sometimes have problems with the firewalls as well. Um, the sort of evidence that you can look at to confirm this is to actually look at what's happening to the recursive client contexts. So if you are suffering this type of attack and the authoritative servers aren't responding, then one clear piece of evidence is which queries are not getting answers or are getting answers very, very slowly. 
Um, also, there may be an increase in persistent sockets. Um, who are, where are the sockets that are being held open um, going to? What are the servers that are under attack? Um, also, sometimes it's worth looking at query logging, although in the case of BIND, query logging is not so much query logging as is query answers <coughs> logging. Um, so if there are no answers going back to the clients, then there won't be a query log entry. But we also have query errors logging, and that can be more useful. And network packet traces, of course, to see what's coming in, what's getting answered, where it's going, how long it's taking. And this is the slide about the user experience, which is the thing that we need to try and fix. Um, some quick, uh, quick guidance. Um, Eliminating open resolvers is clearly a good thing to do, but that's not the whole story now. Um, the whole story involves looking at the compromised clients and trying to deal with those. Uh, but it's whack-a-mole time. Um, <laughs> find the client if you can, get it fixed. I know this is a, this is a big deal. So the more successful strategies have been focused on the resolver itself, although obviously go in and try and fix compromised clients. Uh, don't panic. Um, people quite, come, quite often come to us panicking. Um, a classic response to my server has stopped responding, can't handle this increased traffic, is to say, well, how do I configure it to handle more traffic? How can I make it um, handle 20,000 as opposed to 10,000 queries per second, etc.? Um, or I need to block these clients. Well, actually, they're also making legitimate queries and there are too many of them, so blocking them may not actually solve the problem. So what can we do? Um, the very first strategy that most people deployed, either directly or after working with their uh, recursive server vendors, was the, was the lying. Um, basically, uh, you know that a particular domain is under attack. You know that the authoritative servers are no longer responding to you. So you make yourself authoritative for that domain on a temporary basis so that you immediately respond to all queries with an NX domain. And that's pretty darn effective, actually. Um, but there are problems with it. Um, the problem, two problems. Um, one is that if you're doing it manually, when do you know when to revert the block that you put in place? Um, and the other is that you are still blocking legitimate queries to that domain. Automate it was the next technique, and uh, there are a number of strategies. There's the nominum strategy of monitoring and knowing what to block and what not to block. Um, there are feeds that you can get to bind DNS RPC and other RPC, RPZ, sorry, I'm in the UK. There are, uh, there are providers that will give you a list of, or will help maintain your RPZ, your automated block zone, based on what the current attack is or the flavor of the month is. But you've still got the potential of false positives. Some of our customers decided that the easiest way to automate this was to monitor what was in the backlog of recursive client contexts. The recursive client context is where you maintain that this client has asked this question, therefore is due an answer. So you look at what you've got in your backlog to determine if there are any patterns of clients for particular domains that are not getting answers quickly. But there are some domains that are just popular anyway, so there always will be an ongoing backlog and you don't want to blacklist those. And the automated scripts ended up blacklisting the, the good domains as well as the bad domains. So swings and roundabouts. Yes, you can do that technique. Yes, it's pretty effective. But you have to be careful. And you need some sense of whitelist or some sense of sophistication. And looking at the Amazon.co.uk attack, uh, you need to be even more sophisticated than that if you're going to go forward long term with this blocking technique. because. Somehow you need to be able to detect what are the good queries and what are the bad queries for the same domain. It's not as simple as it looks. 
The strategy that we were experimenting with um, as of last year has been two tuning knobs. Uh, we, we tried a few things along the way and dropped a few. The two that we've gone forward with at the moment that have been the most successful are tuning knobs that look at the backlog of queries, but look at the zone that they're for and also the servers that you're talking to and tune the rate of queries based on the backlog of those in the recursive, clear, recursive client contexts. Um, and the strategy that we put in was that we're going to serve fail them anyway. Therefore, if we know we're going to serve fail them anyway, then we'll serve fail them up front as we're throttling. So we won't just drop them, we will send back the serve fail, which leads me to another discussion a little bit later on. Is it better to serve fail or is it better to drop? Is it better to annex domain for that matter? Uh, the fetches per server, um, and that's the actual tuning knob that we've called it in bind, is a mechanism that monitors the backlog of queries to specific servers. And it tunes and adjusts, adjusts the throttle based on the responsiveness of the server. So while the server is having a lot of backlog, is not responding, then the throttle gets tighter and tighter and tighter on a gradual basis. When the server starts responding again, and there are some thresholds that you can configure, but I think that we've actually got those right and I wouldn't recommend tweaking them. When the server starts responding again, then we gradually push the throttle back down again so that more queries are going through to the server. So we're essentially, we're monitoring the responsiveness and tuning accordingly. So it, A, it's automated. So when the situation gets back to normal, then the queries are start going, going to start going through again. Um, and B, you're automatically detecting the problem as it starts and responding real time to it. Um, Okay, and yeah, uh, we never block the responses, we never block the queries entirely. Um, two reasons, you don't want to block the queries entirely anyway because you want some of the good ones to stand a fighting chance of getting through and getting the answers back into cache for the query, the client queries that you do need to give answers to. Um, and the second is, if you don't send the server any queries, then how are you gonna know when it's responding again? Um, and it's pretty similar, but not quite the same to the way Unbound works anyway when talking to um, authoritative servers. The other thing that we tried was limiting fetches per zone, but that one is not as sophisticated. Uh, the way this one works is it will take a query and then it will go up to the zone above. So if the query is random name dot www dot zone we are looking at not the random query name not the www but the zone above i think we are i think we might be cutting it at www as well and then we set a throttle on how many outstanding queries and this is configurable a throttle on how many outstanding queries you are allowed to have for that domain at any one time, but it's a hard limit, it's a fixed one, it doesn't go up and down. And you can see the effects of that, that's quite interesting in the graphs, because you can see when the throttles are coming in, which one it is based on the backlog of recursive clients. So as promised, results. Um, this was the first graph that anyone sent us, and we were very, very excited. Um, we were excited because we, we, what we saw there was um, an attack taking place, and you can see that with the spikes um, of the inbound requests. But you see that the responses are going quite smoothly, as in the server was nicely tracking response and res uh, query and response, query and response, until the attack came in, and the responses were still nice and smooth. Can anyone see what the actual bug is in this? <laughs> okay, so in the earlier slide, and I deliberately mentioned it, we said that we wrote our tuning so that we sent back the serve fail prematurely. 
So under an attack, this would not actually have been a helpful graph to show the effectiveness of the solution because we should have been sending back the surf fails for the attack traffic as well, but we didn't. <laughs> so there is currently a feature in the uh, per zone um, throttle in that we drop rather than send back the serve fail, which then leads on to the is it better to drop or is it better to serve fail. Certainly from the point of view of graphing the results, it was lovely that we saw this because we could see that throttle come in. Um, here is a similar one. Um, it's the same customer showing, again, more spikes of traffic and more throttle going in with fetches per zone. Um, but you can see that there's quite a lot of grumbling traffic going on in the background that isn't being throttled anyway in the bottom graph. And with that, there is a high proportion of um, NX domains being sent back in the, in the query responses. So there's a lot of traffic. There always will be NX domains anyway. Um, but we looked at the graph, we looked at the logs on this one, um, and we looked at the logging of the throttle, and there is a high level anyway of background grumbling traffic, which tallies with what um, Ralph was saying about the attacks just keep happening. Occasionally there are peaks in new attacks, but there is a lot of grumbling background attack traffic going on full time. So the next result we got in, which was um, also very, very exciting because it was monitoring the, it was tracking the customer experience essentially versus the, the monitoring. Um, what this customer decided to do was to track the backlog of recursive client contexts because we know that when we have a big backlog of recursive client contexts, then we have got a problem. And if that backlog gets too large, then the recursive server runs out of resources and starts misbehaving in other ways as well to legitimate clients. So tracking recursive client context is a good way of monitoring the health of the server. The point at which they switched on the fetches per server, and this is the other throttle, um, is the point where you see that the recursive client stops peaking even though the server responses stay um, at an up and down and up and down level. So the, the surfail responses are indicative of an attack going on. And when they implemented the fetches per server throttle, the, you've still got the peaks in the surfail responses because we're sending them back anyway. So this particular <laughs> throttle, we got it, we did what we said we were going to do and we continue to send the surfails. But we protected the recursive server because we're no longer getting the backlog in recursive clients. Um, this is the same customer who also did some monitoring along the lines of the first customer to report to us. And you can see at the beginning of that, um, if I turn around, I go off mic, don't I? You can see at the beginning of that that uh, the fetches per zone, the zone-based throttling, was coming into play right at the very start of that. And then after that, um, they're tracking, we're tracking responses and queries similarly, but there has been a peak um, in traffic, in surf, there has been a peak in surfile responses. Hang on, am I looking at the right thing here? Yes, there has been a peak in surfile responses. We looked at the logs on this as well. But at that point, the fetches per server kicked in. Um, and the other thing that's interesting on this one is if you look at the recursive clients, the backlog from the customer experience thing that we're monitoring, when we were limiting based on per zone, and remember this is a hard limit, so you can have, say, up to 200, but you might have several zones under attack, so you might have three times 200, one limit for each zone, the recursive client's backlog is still at a reasonably high level. Once we start limiting by server, which is what happens uh, fairly close into the start of that, then the recursive client's backlog goes down. But that's not the whole story. Uh, what will the user see? The objective is to have situation normal, as in you want anybody sending queries to the server to get responses as they would expect to, especially for other domains that are not under attack. There might be some server responses 
particularly where a server that's under attack is hosting not just the, the domain under attack, but other domains, and so it has ceased to become as effectively responsive to your resolver. Um, and if you've chosen to take the, the lying technique, which is to configure us, yourself authoritative for a domain that you know is under attack, then there'll be NX domain responses going back to legitimate queries for that domain. But this is not yet perfect, and this is the last data that we got in, and we're still thinking about it. This is just a minute snapshot of the, the bigger picture. Um, what the complaint was, was that, and if you look at that, the recursive client contexts is not staying nice and low. You want me to do a halfway upside down five minute? <laughs> you can't get the staff. <laughs> Um, the recursive clients are not being maintained at a low value anymore. Um, we're peaking, still not to dangerous levels, but we're still peaking, so we're not as effective as we should be. And also, there is increased memory consumption. What we think was happening, and actually, no, what we know was happening, because again, we have looked at the logs and we have looked at, looked at what's been happening, is that the servers in this case were handling the traffic not as effectively, but they were still handling it. So there were a lot of unique NX domain responses coming back from the server under attack, which were all being put uniquely into cache. So your cache then starts building up with all of this unique NX domain stuff in there, um, and the cache starts filling up. Uh, so you have memory use problems creeping in. So there is yet more to be done. To mitigate the buildup of NX domain responses, there are two things that you can deploy in Bind. One is to limit the TTL of them. Uh, when you cache a, a pseudo record for an NX domain, because it's not a real record, there's nothing to cache. There is no answer other than this doesn't exist. But when you cache that, the server will normally send back an SOA record that tells you how long to cache it for, but you can override it. That's within the RFCs, and so you, configure, you can configure in your server how long you're going to hold one of those in cache. Um, but the other problem in Bind, possibly not in other implementations, is that the cleaning is gentle. So a res uh, an NX domain may expire, or any response may expire from cache, but it won't necessarily get cleaned up unless you really have to. And the really have to is set by uh, setting a maximum cache limit. So you may end up with bind with a, a bunch of expired stuff in cache that you haven't, just haven't done the housekeeping on yet because you haven't needed to. Which is why you might want to configure a cache limit for this type of thing. Uh, more of the same thing showing the types of limiting going on. Um, and again, it was useful that we had the feature in our code here, so you can tell from the green and the blue uh, what type of rate limiting was going on at any one time. And you can see that the rate limiting for fetches per zone, so the zone-based limiting versus the server-based limiting, is not as effective at keeping the recursive client context down, which is unsurprising given the way it's designed at the moment. Um, this one is a bit of a dodgy graph because it's based on the statistics that we put out in the logs. Um, the particularly dodginess is the stuff on the right-hand side where you see that spills above 50% is bigger than all spills. A spill is a, is a we're going to drop this because we're not going to put it through because we're throttling. I think that's an artifact of... The, the way that we do the logging in a non-persistent way. Uh, we haven't really refined the logging yet. It was just a kind of, we better log some stuff to do with this so that we know that we're doing rate limiting. But it was done on constructs in the cache that are non-persistent. And so it's both cumulative, but it resets occasionally. Um, so that's why the results are like that. But it shows you, in generic terms, when there was rate limiting in play and when there wasn't. So we're on to the more ideas bit. Um, one question that we've asked ourselves is, is it better to serve fail, or is it better to drop? Or as some people have said, is it better to NX domain the stuff? I think what we're probably going to do is to put in a switch. Um, the reason to put in a switch is a subtle one. 
uh, it's a two-way subtle one. If you send something back to a client that is sending you bad queries, then it has a chance to not send a repeat. Whereas if you send nothing back to it, then it may well retry the same query because that's the way clients work. And it depends a little on whether the stuff is coming from sophisticated bots that are manufacturing the queries explicitly or whether it's coming from um, something that is working through the resolver client on the device that's sending it. The other reason for actually sending back a response is that um, you might be for having this traffic forwarded to you by another server. And if you don't send back a response, then you're going to be having the same impact on the forwarder as the authoritative servers are having on you. So there are some circumstances when sending back a response is very, very important. Um, we thought about whitelists. Um, we've thought about having override settings per server and per zone. Uh, I've mentioned the reporting and statistics. Um, somebody has suggested to us having an automatic um, detection of zone under attack, therefore I'm going to implement an automatic authoritative zone, essentially. And then there is the big issue of how to handle the good traffic, because ideally you want to be able to give back good answers to good queries for names in the domain under attack. And one suggestion was, well, how about you don't expire the good answers that you've got? Um, I had another, I was talking last night over dinner, and I had another idea which was, okay, so we know which are the good answers that we've had before because we have records in cache for them. So maybe we should whitelist the queries for the things that are already expired. Maybe? Okay. So I haven't passed that one on yet. I only thought of it last night. <laughs> Summary bit techniques, clean up, um, lie, um, try adaptive techniques. Any questions I've now been given the by my <laughs> staff down there? <laughs> Questions? Nope. Oh, I didn't say, uh, anybody who wants to try this code, it's available. One question. But you'll have to ask us for it because we haven't put it out in the mainstream yet. Just, hello, uh, David Freeman from Clarinet. Just a quick question. Are you aware of what other implementations are doing with regards to this? Sort of. Um, I know what Nominum is doing, um, and I have a fair idea how Unbound works. I'm not sure what's going on inside, um, say, PowerDNS. Okay. Thanks. But I'm pretty. I, I think we're all working along the same lines because it all gets talked about at places like DNS OARC. Okay. Any other questions for Kathy? Okay, thank you very much, Kathy. No, there's a question. Oh, sorry. sorry. I'm sorry, Tim Bray from Purview. It's crazy, but could you domain transfer a domain? Do people allow that to work out what's real and what's not real? Oh, you mean slave the domain? Yeah, could you slave the domain? Oh. I mean, it's something that people block now for, to stop people mapping a domain, but might be useful to that's, slave the domain to know what's That's an on. interesting idea. I'll add that to the list of ideas to talk about. We have um, a big meeting next week, and uh, I think this stuff's going to get talked, to th talked about at length, including potential other techniques. I'll add that one to the list. Thank you. Steve Dyer of UK North. Um, everything you've spoken about is sort of reactive to an attack. I just wondered, do you, are there people out there who are looking at who the attackers are? Are they script kiddies or are they more malicious people? And are there any ways of making life difficult for them by poisoning things like the, the scripts that they use? I don't know. I assume that there are legal entities out there, law enforcement entities out there looking at this stuff, but I don't know what they're doing. Uh, do you have any clue? Hello? Okay. So, 
we are doing some of this analysis and uh, we are passing that on to the uh, respective parties who go for after that. But it's really hard because these tools are really out there and uh, um, there are new tools built ever so often. And uh, if you have, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure how to get into that stream because what we are doing is more and less and then kind of passing on the data. But I think it's really hard to poison these tools. I love the idea of, you, of writing malware to defeat malware. <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea too. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you, Kathy.